We are in the uh, midst of our kind of frequently asked question series. We're going to end it this week. This is the last one. Uh, and we've had some fantastic questions, some really interesting questions that are, some are just so big it, it, we can't really take the time to answer them in a few sentences. And uh, so if you kind of had one of those, we're sorry that we couldn't kind of get to that, but thank you for submitting them. Uh, there was one question that kind of came in last week that kind of really intrigued me because it reminded me of uh, when I was younger, something that I struggled with a little bit. Uh, and it said, there's a passage in Hebrews uh, that says, we have a great crowd of witnesses around us kind of watching us. Does that mean that my spouse who's in heaven can see what's going on down here? And I struggled with this when I was kind of younger because I was like, man, that's really freaky. Can you imagine that everybody who's died that we know is up in heaven watching us? <laughs> oh, it's, I think it's pretty weird, and I don't really want that. I don't really want people watching me because it's like, ah, I don't always do the right things. But I thought it was a good question because what it's talking about there is this passage in Hebrews. It starts with a therefore. It says, therefore. Whenever there's a therefore in Scripture, we've got to look, what was it there for? What's he saying? There's something that's gone before that, and so we've got to look back. And in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, uh, Paul, uh, the writer, whoever wrote Hebrews, is talking about the heroes of faith, people who've gone before us, who've lived a life that has honors God. They haven't done it perfectly. They haven't been perfect. It's people like Abraham and Moses and, uh, and David, and they all failed massively in some ways, but they kept faithful to God all the way through it. And what he's talking about is these are the kind of people we want to be looking at. These are the kind of people that will spur us on to keep living the same life of faith. And not only that, these people never got to see the Messiah. They never got to see Jesus. They, they knew God had something planned, but they never got to see it. They all died long before the promise ever came. But now as Christians, as believers, we've seen the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. So how much more should our lives be a witness, be a testimony to those around us and those going on before us. So it's basically, they're a witness, they're just a testimony. These are the kind of lives that we should be emulating and should be uh, seeking to uh, kind of be ourselves as well because now we know Jesus, so we've got something even greater uh, for people to follow. So I hope that makes sense and you can breathe easy now. You can relax, nobody's watching you except God. Well, there you go. So we're going to turn things around a little bit this week because you've asked some fantastic questions, but now we're going to look at some questions that God asks us. Are you ready to answer some questions that God asks you? Well, that's, that's a little bit more positive than that, than the nine because everybody just went quiet. <laughs> it's like, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> and I think of Job. You know, when we read the book of Job and his story, Job's a pretty depressing book generally. Uh, it's not an easy book to read, and there's kind of 40-odd chapters of, of Job's life. And Job, it starts off, Job's got a really good life. His life is going great for him. I mean, it's just fantastic. He's got a wife, his children, his business is doing well. He owns all his livestock. I mean, it really couldn't be any better for Job. And, he, and, he's, and he's worshiping God, and he's living life for God. Well, then the devil comes up to Job, and we have this, kind, we have this little sneak peek into heaven. Where it says, Satan came to God and said, well, of course Job would praise you. His life's absolutely fantastic. Who wouldn't praise you if the life was that good? I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit. And, and then so Satan kind of puts this thing to God and says, so why don't we just make it a little bit more uncomfortable for him? And then see how he praises you. Let's see what that does for him. And God says, well, okay, yeah, I'll let you do that. You can't kill him, but yeah, you can affect his life and, and we'll see what happens. And so what basically happens is Job's life goes from like absolute amazingness to utter disaster overnight. Literally, his wife and all his children are killed. He loses everything that he's had. His health goes downhill dramatically to the point that he really just wants to kill himself because it's so horrendous. And then, then if you've ever heard this phrase, Job's comforters. These are Job's friends. You really don't want friends like Job's friends. They really don't do him much good at all. And they have some kind of interesting things to say. Not all of it's wrong, but generally, they're not really helping Job at all. And it gets to the point where even Job, he's, he's, he's done pretty well. He's, he's trying to think, you know, I don't understand everything, but I'm sure God is good. But even at the end, Job's starting to wonder, like, I don't get this at all, because we've had the sneak peek into heaven. Job hasn't got a clue what's going on here. God hasn't let him in on the secret. 
He is as bewildered as anybody would be if their life had just gone from good to bad overnight. And then there's this uh, verse in verse 38 where God turns the tables. Job's had all of these questions. His friends have had all of these questions. Then God turns the tables on him and he says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? I can imagine this kind of booming voice coming from heaven. Who is this? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. (laughs) I think at this point, Job would be like, oh my word, what have I done? I didn't mean it, Lord. It's all okay. But then God literally, for the next two chapters, just hurls this barrage of questions at Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions? What supports its foundations? Who laid its cornerstone? Uh, Job, have you ever commanded the morning to appear? Did you cause the dawn to rise in the east? Tell me, Job, where does light come from? We know a little bit more now, but think back to Job. You know, science wasn't quite as advanced back then. Where does darkness go, Job? Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you regulate them? Can you make lightning and appear and direct it where you want to go, Job? I'm thinking, Job, just be like, open up earth and swallow me right now. (laughs) And then God says, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You're God's critic, but do you have the answers? And I love Job's response. I know you can do anything, and no one can stop you. (laughs) Good answer. (laughs) You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know whether you're as skeptical as can be, whether this whole Christian faith means nothing to you, and somebody dragged you here this morning kicking and screaming. That's okay. We're glad that you're here this morning. Maybe you're here and you're kind of kicking the tires of the Christian faith, so to speak. Say, yeah, I'm kind of interested, but I'm not really sure what it's all about yet. I'd like to know a little bit more. It seems to make sense, but... Uh, I still need some more uh, understanding about it. Many of us here have given our life to Christ. We've been following Jesus for years. You know, but I don't know about you, but sometimes life gets a little bit dark. And we don't know. We don't have an insight like Job did as to what's going on. It seemed to be going well, but then all of a sudden something's gone wrong. And we're living life in the dark. And I don't know where God is. And I don't know what that looks like anymore. And we all have times like that. So no matter where you are this morning, I'm glad that you're here. Welcome to church. So are you ready to answer God this morning? Amen. Good. Come on, we're going to anyway, so you don't really get a choice. The first question is, where are you? Right at this point in life, where are you? What's going on? What's brought you to where you are? You know, one of the, this, this is the second question in the Bible. It's right in Genesis chapter 3, right at the very beginning. The first question was actually the serpent that had come to try and deceive Adam and Eve, try and tempt them to eat uh, of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And his question was, did God really say? You know, he's always sowing doubt, trying to make us not believe what God really said. And then God comes. When they've eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they instantly know they've done something wrong. It's just like, oh my word, overcome with guilt and shame. And in Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, as he always did, and they were never afraid of him. But they hid from the Lord their God among the trees. So God called to the man, Where are you? Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you hiding from God? Is there something that's gone wrong in your life where you've pulled back from God? You've stopped believing, you've stopped trusting the way that you used to. There's a lot of things that can cause us to hide from God, and sin is one of them. It was for Adam and Eve. They knew straight away they'd done something wrong, and it had ruined their relationship with God. It had created fear that wasn't meant to be there the way that it was. And we feel bad when we do something wrong, don't we? we? You know, even if we're not really, nobody's ever told us it's wrong, there's something in the in us that tells us I've done wrong. That, that it's built into us a sense of right and wrong, and we can't escape it. You know, it's like, have you ever tried to push a beach ball under the water? Yeah. You know, you can only hold it there for so long, till eventually, poof, it's back out again. 
You know, and, 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 and this, sen- this sense of sin and right and wrong is within us. We can try and suppress it for so long, but eventually the truth is going to come out. You know, I remember reading about a, a tribe some years ago. It was an ancient uh, tribe, I think in South America somewhere, and they'd literally been cut off from civilization for centuries. They were living as primitively as ever they had been. And as they got to know this tribe and they got to kind of uh, figure out a little bit more about who they are and learn their language, they started to talk to them about God and about their sense of right and wrong and their, and their kind of moral compass. And what they said was, we've never heard about God. We don't know anything about Jesus. Nobody's ever told us about those things. But we instinctively know when we've done something wrong. I think that's incredible. Totally cut off from civilization. Nobody's ever told them the rules of life, but they knew within them that something was right and something was wrong. And then that sense of sin, that, that, that feeling guilty, leads to a sense of feeling unworthy. You know, that I, how can God love me the way that he does when he knows what I'm really like? You know, God is this pure and perfect and holy being. There's not a single ounce of sin in him at all. And yet, he wants to be with us. But that, 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 that sense of unworthiness almost keeps us from him. I just feel too bad. I can't, I can't be with God today. And we feel bad about sin. And actually, that's a good thing sometimes. There's a, there's a right side of sin making us feel bad. That when we hurt somebody with the words that we use, we should feel bad about it. We should. That's a good thing. And that sense of right and wrong is meant to prevent us from doing the bad things. So that when we realize that I've, I've hurt somebody, I don't want to do that again. I realize that was wrong and I don't want to do it. And, and, and the Bible would call that conviction. That when God brings that sense of right and wrong into us, it's a sense of conviction that I know that I've done something wrong and I want to change. I don't want to do that again. It's actually meant to stop us doing the bad things and lead us to doing the right things. But of course, we have an enemy as well. The enemy of our soul, Satan. He's a deceiver and a liar. And he's constantly telling us how bad we are. And his is called condemnation. He doesn't convict us to lead us to doing right things. He condemns us and makes us feel even worse than we possibly do in the first place. He just heaps on guilt and shame and unworthiness. How could you do that? You call yourself a Christian and you did that. You said that. God can't possibly love you now. And he just stirs the pot all the time. You know, whenever I'm going along the highway, we live out in Carrenport, and I go through the 80 zone there on the highway with the speed cameras, and, uh, and I don't have a problem with them at all. I think it's a great thing, you know, it's a safety thing. But I usually set my cruise at about 79 because I just want to make sure that I'm not going to get that ticket. And there's a, but there's something within me that I can't help but glance in the mirror every single time just to make sure the light didn't flash. Because I know if the light flashed, I'm going to get a letter in the post there is going to be a consequence to going too fast. And depending on how fast I go, I might end up in court before a judge. So it creates a healthy fear. Does that make sense? Yes. So there's actually a good sense where we should feel wrong. When you're driving along the highway at 110, how many times when you pass a cop at the side of the road, you get a little bit kind of butterflies in your stomach, and you, what do you instantly do? Check the speedo even though you know you've set the cruise at 110, because none of us break the law. <clears throat> it's a healthy fear, because I know that if he comes out behind me and pulls me up, there's going to be a consequence. We should have a healthy fear of God. He is God, and the Bible says that he will judge us one day. Every single person who has ever lived will one day stand before God and we'll have to give an account for our life. The difference is for those who put their trust in Jesus, it's not condemnation. We stand knowing that Jesus' perfect life has been credited to us. Not because we've done the perfect life, but because he did and we've put our trust in him. But what if you haven't given your life to Christ? What if you haven't transferred that trust into Jesus? What will happen when you stand before God on that day? I want you to think about that this morning. We're not about scaring people into heaven. We're about showing people that God has done something so amazing for us in Jesus Christ. The question is, why would you not want that? Why would you not want the life that Jesus offers? 
Are you hiding from God this morning? Have you tried to follow God? Have you tried to trust him, but it hasn't worked out the way that you thought it would? You've tried to live a life that honors him. You've tried to be faithful in the things that he's called you to do, but somehow life just is not working the way it's supposed to. Maybe you're one of those who's been tithing for years, you know, giving faithfully of your finances, and yet there's still too much month left at the end of the money. It just doesn't stretch far enough, and I don't understand, God. Your word says that you will, uh, you will bless us if we're faithful to you in this way. And yet it's not happening. And then Joe Soap comes along, who's just given his life to Christ, hasn't paid a blind bit of notice to you for the last 40 years, goes into work on Monday, gets a massive job promotion and a huge pay rise. Are you kidding me, God? Seriously? What about us? Maybe you've been praying for a baby for years and nothing's happened. But all your friends around you have got pregnant and had kids. One, two, three, four kids. And we're praying, God, just one. All we want is just one. Why not us, Lord? It would have been enough just to have one. Maybe you're that student who's trying so hard at college, flogging your guts out just to get some resemblance of a grade. You want to be noticed on the worship team. Why won't they pick me? Why don't they see that I would love to be part of that? You know, I, 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 I could be a volleyball player. Why don't they pick me? I could do that. I'm sure I could do that. And then that girl comes along. She barely sneezes and gets 97% on a midterm. She's the captain of the volleyball team. And then she leads the worship team like heaven's opened. And all the angels, angels are there singing, Hallelujah. And we're left standing there saying, why is life so hard for me and yet so easy for them? They don't seem to have to work for anything. I feel like I have to work for everything. You know, things like that cause us to pull back from God. And we start to hide. We've actually stopped trusting God. We've actually stopped believing God a little bit. He does it for them, but he doesn't do it for me. I don't know why. I still love God. I haven't lost my faith, but I just feel like he's not interested in helping me. And that leads to us starting to feel a little bit disappointed with God. We almost get a little bit resentful towards him. So why them and why not me? Why is the blessing not equal, Lord? Why does it have to seem to be one-sided? I've tried to follow you. I've tried to live the life to honor you. I still love you. But then when I pray, nothing seems to happen. It just seems to be absolute silence. And I've been going through that myself for a a little while now where I'm praying about some big things and I'm asking God, why? Why is there no answer? I can almost handle a no, as difficult as that might be, but the silence, ah, I find that so hard. I, I I don't know what to do with that, God. Why won't you answer my prayers? Why do I feel like you're ignoring me sometimes? And I remember a quote by Corrie ten Boom, she was a, a Dutch lady uh, who lived through the, uh, the concentration camps. Her family were put in the concentration camps because they were hiding Jews uh, that were being smuggled out of Germany. And they were found and they were sent to the camps. Suffered just horrendous things, you know, that we can't possibly imagine that any human would have to go through. And she survived. And one of the things that she says was that, you know, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, we don't throw away our ticket and jump off the train. We sit still and we trust the engineer. We don't know what's going on. We don't know particularly where we're going. We can't seem to see anything. But God says, I am God. You know, we've even sang it this morning in so many of the songs. You know, God is there. He's still working even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. Because he's promised to constantly be with us, to always be with us. And I know it's hard through these times, but he's asking us to just sit still and wait. Don't try and figure it out for yourself. That's my biggest hang-up. Uh, you know, when God's not answering, I've got, there must be a solution. I'll figure it out. I'm a practical person. I can do this. And yet God's saying, Barry, stop it. Sit still and wait. And it's the hardest thing. Where are you? Are you hiding from God this morning? What's brought you to the place in life where you're at right now? Is it time to trust God again? Is it time to just worship him again? You know, so many times in our life, we just have to worship God. We don't understand what's going on. We're like Job. Things have just gone absolute awol in our life. 
But there's one thing I know, that God is still God. He hasn't changed one single bit, and so he's still worthy of my worship. You know, because one of the things, when I was thinking about this, God reminded me something of, uh, that I've said to myself and to so many people over the years. If God never did a single thing else for me until Jesus comes back, I've got more than enough to worship him for just in the fact that he saved me. He's given me a hope and a future that this world could never, ever give. That alone is worthy of my worship. So why do we want to throw it all away just because we're going through a tough time? If God is still God, if he's still worthy to be worshipped, then let's worship him. Let's trust him and believe that he'll bring us through this. And that leads into the next question that actually says, who do you say that I am? If we believe that God is who he says he is and that he can be trusted, then we have to trust him even when we don't see what's coming or what's going to happen or what is happening at the moment. You know, Matthew writes in his gospel, in uh, chapter 16, verse 13, he says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? He's talking about himself. They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that's a powerful question. It's a very soul-searching question, and it's not a question that we can ignore at all. It doesn't matter whether we are followers of Jesus or whether we're the complete opposite and don't want anything to do with them. It's still a question that we have to answer. Because Jesus made some very, very bold claims about who he was. You know, and one of the trouble with uh, atheists is that um, there's no meaning to life. There's no purpose to life. We came from nothing and we're going nowhere. It's an utterly meaningless existence. So that means really there are no consequences. It's all just relative. That means that if I get caught for speeding, there's no consequences. Is there? If I get caught for stealing and I end up in court, is there going to be some consequence for that? Absolutely there is. Life is full of consequences. If I stick my finger in a fire, is there going to be a consequence? You better believe there is. I am going to feel it. Life is full of consequences. And so to assume that after the end of all of this, there's going to be no consequence at all, then why is our whole life ruled by consequences? Why does our whole existence full of consequences? We can't be simply coming from nothing and going nowhere. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I cannot understand atheists who spend all of their time trying to convince people that a God who they do not believe exists does not exist. They're just constantly going around telling people God doesn't exist. He doesn't exist, he doesn't exist. So if I get caught for speeding and I end up in court with a judge and the judge is sat there, I can go around the courtroom and tell everybody else, it's okay, he's not real. He doesn't really exist. Just believe it and you'll be fine. <laughs> Convince yourself. If he's not there, he's not there. And then all of a sudden, my name gets called uh, Barry Dringle. And I'm like, oh, there is a judge. Now what? What do we do now? And I wonder if sometimes we deny the existence of God because we don't really want to have to believe that one day we're going to have to answer to him. Because it means that if he's not really real and I pretend that he's not real, I can live life however I want and there won't be any consequence. But there will. There is always consequence because God's built it into the universe that he created. He's built it into us. That's why we know right and wrong. And maybe some of you here are hiding from God because you really don't want to accept the fact that he is real and therefore my life's going to have to change if I choose to believe that he's real. And yet for some reason we think that the change that God wants to bring into our life is going to be the worst thing possible. And yet Jesus says, I've come to give you life, life to the full. Does that sound like something you don't want? He's not out to spoil our fun. He's out to give us the most meaningful life that we could ever possibly experience. But then if we don't choose to believe that, I've got to come up with some other explanation for why I instinctively know that there's right and wrong. Why can't I shake the guilt for all the bad things that I do? I, I, I still find pleasure in sinning sometimes, but I still know that it's wrong and I can't get away from that. God's built it into us and we can't escape it. 
We can't simply bury our heads in the sand and hope that God is not real. That would be pretty foolish. And so the question is, who do you say that Jesus is? And I think one of the reasons Jesus is asking this is because there's lots of rumors going around about him. At this point, his ministry is well underway. He's been healing people. He's been uh, delivering people. He's been raising people from the dead. This stuff doesn't normally happen. They, they even say that when he speaks, the people were amazed at his teaching. He didn't speak like the normal religious teachers of the, of, the, of the day. They were out kind of telling people, well, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do... They eventually ended up with 613 commandments in the Jewish law that they had to obey from day one of being born to the day they die without a single mistake in the hope that you might be saved. None of us have done that and none of us can do that. It's always about be better and try harder. Jesus was the complete opposite. He was about put your trust in me. Follow me. I'll, I'll give you salvation. It's in me. It's not in anything else. And so I think Jesus is trying to figure out, you know, who people, what people are saying about him. But he's also coming around to then the question where he asks his disciples, so who do you say that I am? How many people do we listen to and think that they must be right because, well, they're either intelligent, you know, they're quite powerful people. How many of us have been told things by our parents when we're kind of growing up that if you stare at the TV too long, your eyes will become square? Yeah. <laughs> you know? If you pull that face and the wind changes, it'll stay like that. <laughs> we all know now they probably weren't right. And thankfully not. But sometimes we listen to people that we respect and assume that they're right without ever doing any research for ourselves because it's just easier. Actually, it can be quite hard to do research for ourselves sometimes. Where do I even start? I don't even know where to start looking at this. What rumors have you heard about Jesus? What have you heard in the past that you've just taken on board and thought, oh, that must be right. It fits with me. It makes me feel comfortable. I can believe that God doesn't exist and there'll be no consequences because that, that's okay then. I can live life the way that I want. You know, but we should do research. You know, I'm one of those kind of nerdy people that if I'm looking at anything like a, I want a new TV, I'm looking at a computer, I'm thinking about a new car, I will research the living daylights out of it. I want to know what's wrong with it. I want to know what's right with it. I want to know what people think about it. And we need to do that for some things. How many of you, when you got married, just decided that day, I think I'm just going to find somebody to marry. I'm just going to pick the next person that walks around the corner. Good luck with that. Hopefully, you've spent a whole lot more time making that decision to get married and spend the rest of your life with that person. So many people I know have bought a, a car because they like the color of it. I'm like, oh my word. <laughs> it only does 10 miles to the gallon and I need it for a commuter car, but I love the color. Do some research. We spend hours and days and weeks, even months, thinking about things that are really only to do with this life. They have no real effect on what's after this. But what if there is an eternity? What if there is something after this and you've given it no thought or time? Are you prepared to gamble your whole eternity on the flimsy hope that you might be right that there is no God? That there is no consequence after this? Have you even researched eternity at all? You know, eternity is, is so big. You know, sometimes I sit there and I try and think about eternity and honestly I feel like my head's going to explode. I think, what am I going to be doing for the rest of forever? I don't know, God, can I take my car? I mean, do I have to leave, ev do I have to leave everything behind? I, I just don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, we have a hint, you know, I think we'll still be working. I think God will redeem it all. He said he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to make it how it was meant to be, which is going to be fantastic. We're not going to work to provide any kind of uh, income for ourselves. We're not going to work to, to prove myself to anything, to find my self-worth in any of it, because Jesus will be everything. And it will be exactly how it was created to be. But what it, exactly it will look like, I don't know. But I still wonder, what will eternity be like? What is eternity for you outside of Jesus Christ? Where is your hope? Are you going to stand before God one day and try and convince him that you should be allowed to spend eternity with him? You know, sometimes when we think about people that we should listen to, 
There are certain people that we should listen to. And I think Jesus is one of them, and I'll tell you why. Jesus predicted his own death and his own resurrection to life again, and then he went and pulled it off. How many people do you know have done that? There's only one. There's only Jesus. And not only that, it was prophesied hundreds of years before him. It was predicted that that's exactly what was going to happen, and that's exactly what did happen. The book of Isaiah even graphically details how he would die. And that's exactly how he died. Nobody really has the control over that. Jesus couldn't really control how he was going to die. He might have been able to dictate that he was going to die, but he even died exactly the way that he was supposed to. And then three days later, was raised to life again. He's not dead anymore. I don't know who can do that. I would say that's probably somebody worth listening to. It's at least somebody worth investigating a little bit more and finding out, is this guy who he says he really is? Because Jesus made some massive claims about who he was. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. In other words, there, there is no other, it's just me. And his claim was that he was God. And that nobody could come to the Father except through him. He said, there is no multiple roads or all roads lead to God. It's not that at all. He said, it's only through me. This is what Jesus said of himself. Those are massive claims. Have you ever found people who've claimed to be God? We used to have one. We used to have a guy in England who was an old newscaster. can't remember his name now. Weird guy. <laughs> claimed literally to be the son of God on TV and everything. The amazing thing is he died. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Maybe he wasn't the son of God after all. I'm pretty sure God can't die. Plus the fact he did absolutely nothing. Didn't do any of the miracles that Jesus did. Didn't raise anybody from the dead. Lots of people can claim to be God, but boy, you better be able to back it up. And Jesus did every single time he backed it up. Now, we've got to understand that Jesus didn't leave it up to us just to think, well, he's just a good teacher or a good person. There's actually other religions that believe that Jesus was a, a prophet or a teacher. He was way more than that. He never claimed to be anything less than God. So then we're left with the conclusion that either he's an absolute raving lunatic who's, asked, who's managed somehow to dupe three billion people into believing that he's the son of God and that he's worth following and even for some laying down their lives for. Or he is who he says he is. He is the son of God. And he did die for us. And he did raise to new life so that we could have new life. The question is, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that I am?